A long, long time ago, I had a cat. She was white, and her name was Teleco. And Teleco was a mighty, mighty hunter. Teleco would range out into the woods, and she would bring me copperheads. And she would bring me, one time she even brought me a diamondback rattler. She was a mighty hunter. One time she brought me a black and tan coon dog. I heard this terrible uproar on the back porch. I rushed out on the back porch, and there is this black and tan coon dog jumping up and down, going, ay, ay, ay. And Teleco is raking his undersides. And that dog is looking at me like, would you please help me? And I did. I stepped between him and Teleco, and he jumped over the rail and got out of there. And the last I saw of Teleco that afternoon was her chasing him across the field. Now, Teleco had another characteristic, and that is when she and I were out in the woods, if I called her, she would come. She would range out, and I wouldn't see her for 20, 30 minutes at a time. But if I called Teleco, she'd come back. So one day, not so very long ago, Teleco and I went fishing. And so we went down to the creek, and as soon as we got to the creek, Teleco went out ranging. She was just looking around to see, you know, what was going on. And I began to grunt up some worms. Now, you all know about grunting worms? How many people here know about grunting worms? Okay, well, the way I do it is I, I got me a stob about that big around, about that long, and I drive it about halfway down in the ground, and I take an old leaf spring from a Ford pickup truck, and I rub the top of that stop, and he goes, rum, 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 rum. and the worms can't stand it. The vibration makes them crazy. They come right out of the ground and give themselves up. So that day, I was down at the, I was down at the creek, rum, rum, and worms were crawling out of the ground, giving themselves up. I was stuffing my pockets with worms. I was ready to go fishing. And all of a sudden, I heard Bleh! behind me. And before I could turn around, I heard Bleh! over to the left. And then I heard Bleh! over to the right. And I turned around, and there's three alligators <laughs> zeroing in on me. Well, first thing I did naturally was I called Teleco! Second thing I did, I figured, you know, a good, best defense is good offense. So I took that leaf spring and I ran right straight at the very closest alligator. And I jammed that leaf spring right in his mouth. <laughs> and just like in the cartoons, it worked. I thought, well, that was good. So I headed over to the stop. I was going to wiggle it out of the ground and use it as, uh, for the, in, in the same way. I was going to head to the next closest alligator. And, but just as I bent over to pull the stop up, I heard spring. And that first spring popped out of that first alligator's mouth and went screaming over my head like a lawnmower blade. Well, now, the good news is that leaf spring caught the second alligator right in the hinges of his jaw. <laughs> At which point, that alligator was completely locked with jaw and couldn't do nothing about it. You know, so I was reasonably safe from him. His mouth was just hanging open. So I went back to the stob. And just as I managed to get the stob out of the ground, I heard, and looked up, and there's Teleco flying through the air, all 10 claws on both ends, all 20 claws, fully extended, eyes gleaming red, all the hair on her body standing straight up, her tail like a bottle brush, and she landed on the back of alligator number three. And thence commenced the most incredible battle you have ever seen in your life. Does anybody remember the old Johnny Weissmuller movies where Johnny, where Tarzan 
wrestles an alligator in the in the in the and they just quarrel and the alligator jumps up and and rears on its back legs like a horse and dives and you know, you know that alligator was doing every bit of that and Teleco was hanging on and the whole time that she was hanging on she was screaming <laughs> like a banshee at a Irish wake following a massacre well I thought, well, that's good. That takes care of all three alligators. But then I remembered the one who had spoiling the spring. You know, well, that one's still, still in action. So I turned, I turned with my stop to look back toward alligator number one, and there it is. And that alligator has learned his lesson, and he's coming at me with his mouth closed. <laughs> Well, I didn't know what to do. So I took my stop and I ran straight at that alligator and I hit him as hard as I could right between the eyes and yelled, bad gator. <laughs> and he kind of stopped for a minute and then he resumed coming after me. So I thought I'd better try again. So I hauled off and I whacked him just as hard as I could right between the nostrils on the end of his snout. I just Bam! Bad gator. And, he, and then he ran backwards. Did you know alligators can run backwards? That alligator ran backwards right into the river. And then I turned over to see if I what I needed if I needed to do anything about lopper jaw. And lopper jaw is over there just right. And when he saw that he went right back in the river too. And so then I said, well, you know, I got to go help Teleco. I mean, she's the hero of this story, right? I got to go help her, see what kind of, see what kind of help she needs. And I turned to Teleco, and you know what? She didn't need any help at all. She had tamed that alligator. She had her claws dug in. And if she wanted that alligator to go right, she just did that, and the alligator went right. And if she wanted the alligator to go left, she just did that, and the alligator went left. She wanted to go forward this way. She wanted that alligator to stop, she did this. And if she wanted it to back up, she did that. Well, she had done such a good job with that alligator, I let her keep him. <laughs> and forever after that, when Teleco and I would go on our gallivant and out in the woods, Teleco would check the weather report and look at the topographic map and figure out whether she's going to get her feet wet or not. You know, cats don't like to get their feet wet. <laughs> and if she was going to get her feet wet, she'd just ride her gator. <laughs> well, back when I was working with the Nature Conservancy, I was doing a lot of work down on the Roanoke River, and one of the tributaries of the Roanoke River is Gardner Creek. And one day I decided to go fishing down at Gardner Creek. So I went down to the bait shop at Gardner Creek, and I walked in, and there's this guy sitting behind the counter, and he's got this name tag on that says his name is Dwight. And so I walked up to him, and I said, good afternoon, Dwight. And he said, Dwight. And I said, P beg your pardon, and he said, it's Dwight. And I said, okay, Dwight. Uh, what do people fish around, w w fish for here with? What do people fish with here? And he says, oh, crickets mostly. And I said, well, Dwight, would you sell me some crickets? And he said, yes, I certainly would. So while Dwight's getting me a box of crickets, I went over to look at the bulletin board. And in the middle of the bulletin board, there's a laminated newspaper article. I mean, you know, somebody's proud of this. And it says that Dwight has just stepped down. He's just retired after seven years reigning as the cricket spitting champion of the world. <laughs> so I turned to him, I said, Dwight? Is this even remotely real? I mean, you, you made this up, right? You got this made at the state fair. It's, it's a gag. And he says, oh, no. Oh, no, I was, 
I was the cricket spitting champion of the world for seven years. Now, now it's kind of an exaggeration, you see, because the only people who spit crickets are people here in the Carolinas. And so when we say cricket spitting champion of the world, we really just mean the Carolinas. <laughs> and I said, oh, okay. I said, so Dwight, if you were the cricket spitting champion for seven years, you must have some secrets. And he says, well, I got two. And I said, well, what are they? And he said, I ain't never told nobody. <laughs> and I said, well, you're retired. You've stepped down. And he said, well, all right, I, I'll tell you the first one anyway. The first one is when you spit your cricket, you put him in your mouth, and when you spit your cricket, you don't go like it's bad soup or tobacco juice. You don't go, because then you just end up with a bunch of slobber and cricket parts all over the place, and you're automatically disqualified. <laughs> he said, what you got to do is you got to put the cricket on the end of your tongue, you know, and you got to roll your tongue up, and then you got to spit that cricket like a watermelon seed. You go, And I said, oh, okay, well, that makes perfect sense. Dwight, what was your second secret? And he says, you know, truth is, all the cricket spitters kind of know secret number one. At least the elite cricket spitters do. But I ain't never told the secret number two. And I said, come on, Dwight, please. He said, well, all right. You see, when you spit your cricket, you don't want him going through the air like this, because ah! that'll slow him down. He said, you want him going through the air like this. <laughs> so what I would do on the day of the contest is I would carry me around a frozen Dr. Pepper, rock hard, I'd put it in the freezer the night before, and a rock hard, do frozen Dr. Pepper, carried around my hand like this, and then when the time came, I'd reach into the cricket box and I'd pick me up a cricket and I'd hold it in my ice cold hand and that cricket would pass out. <laughs> and then I'd lay him on the end of my tongue and he'd go, and I'd win. <laughs> and I said, and I, Dwight, you're making that up. And he said, no, no, that's the truth. And I said, Dwight, I cannot tell you how much I owe you for that story. But how much do I owe you for the box of crickets? And he says, oh, a dollar. So I took my box of crickets, and I went on down to Gardner Creek and put on my waders. And I loaded up my Shakespeare rod and my Johnson Century reel. And I waded out, and I hooked on a cricket. And I, I flipped him out there with the bobber on the line. You know, I flipped him out there, do a little float fishing on and you know how bobber fishing goes, you just sort of wait and see what happens. Nothing happened. <laughs> so I reeled it in and I tried another direction. By the time that, that cricket was kind of soggy, so I threw it away. And I got me another cricket and I went, Whew! and I waited for a little while and nothing happened. So I tried, okay. I, I can, I, I can, I'm help, I can get this, I, I'll troll with cricket. So I got me a little trolling lure and put it on the end of my line, took the bobber off, flipped it, flipped it out. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. So I changed lures, and I did, Orvis makes a lure that looks exactly like a silver platter. So I put my cricket on a silver platter, and I flipped him out, <laughs> nothing, <laughs> nothing. Well, I tried jigging. You know what jigging is. You take it, you, you just put the cricket on the end of the line with a little tinker and go. <laughs> Helps to sing a little song while you're doing it, you know. And nothing. I could not attract a fish with my crickets. And I didn't have any other bait. And so I was kind of getting worried about it. I just, you know, th this is not gonna work. 
And I began to take solace with my buddy, George Dickel, who travels with me pretty much everywhere. <laughs> and so George, George and I communed a little bit. And that is when I had my first genius idea of the day. See, back when I traveled in the South Pacific, and in the Solomon Islands, they have a strategy for calling sharks. And so they wade into the water and they do the Solomon Island shark call, and when the sharks swim in, they club them, drag them ashore, and eat them. And a whole village, whole village can get by on a pretty big shark for a while. And so I thought, all right, I'll try the Solomon Island shark call. So I did. It goes, Humba, humba, get you, get you, goomba, humba, humba, get you, get you, goomba, humba, humba, get you, get you, goomba. <laughs> and I looked downstream, and there was turbulence in the water. And then I looked upstream, and there was turbulence in the water. And I thought, man, this is working. Those Solomon Islanders are onto something. I know there's not sharks in here, but there's going to be some big fish. So I did it again. Humba, humba, get you, get you, goomba, etc. And and then I started feeling things bumping into my legs. And I thought, man, there's some big fish in here. And I looked down, and it wasn't fish. It was snapping turtles. It turned out that the Solomon Island shark call translated into snapping turtle call on Garner Creek. <laughs> and there must have been 60 snapping turtles, and they were mad. That shark call had irritated them, and so they were trying to bite me. But I had on my waders, and so they couldn't get purchased. So they'd go, how? and just slide right off. Well, George and I had were far enough along so that I found this fascinating. I was just amazed that all these snapping turtles were trying to bite me and having no luck at it. And so I began whacking them with my Shakespeare and poking them. And dancing around, I was kind of capering a little bit, you know, the way somebody does who's having a really good time after having a little bit of communion with George. And, and then I had my second brilliant idea of the day. I, too, could spit crickets. I had a whole bunch of crickets left. And I didn't have an ice cold can of Dr. Pepper. But I had George. So I'd take a little sip of George, and then I'd slip a cricket in. <laughs> and in, in no time at all, <coughs> excuse me, that cricket was comatose. <laughs> and then I would swallow the tincture of cricket, and then I would go, Whoo! and that cricket would fly through the air, Whoo! and bam, pop a snapping turtle right in the eye. Well, how much fun is that? I mean, seriously. So I'd, every now and then I'd do a little more, more Solomon Island shark call to keep them agitated. And, and, you know, I'd whack them with my Shakespeare and I'm poking fun at them and laughing at them. I am mocking these turtles like turtles have never been mocked. That, I just thought they were hilarious. And every few minutes I'd take another sip of George, another cricket. Pop another snapping turtle right in the eye. Well, I kept this up for a while. And then I ran out of crickets. And I decided, well, and then I reached for George for consolation, and I was out of George, too. So I said, all right, well, time to go home. So I started for the bank. And as I got into shallower and shallower water, 
my waiter started slipping down. And I couldn't figure it out. And I looked down, and you know those little tabby things on the fronts of your waders? There are two here and two here, and there's two on the back here and here that, that your suspenders are supposed to hook to? Well, I didn't have suspenders on that day. And those eight little tabby things front and back, each one of them had caught a snapping turtle. And so as I, I hitched up my waders and waded out of the water, I looked like a Marine going ashore with eight landmines on a utility belt. <laughs> Well, when I got to the back of the car, I opened the trunk, and then I slid out of my waders as gently and cautiously as I possibly could because I didn't want to disturb those snapping turtles. I didn't want them to let go. And eventually, I was able to step out of the waders and put the whole collection, waders and turtles, in the back in the trunk. Closed the lid and went home. And that night, I made a big pot of turtle soup. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is how I became famous as the man who invented mock turtle soup.